All right, so if a natural hush has started to fall, and if the last group of people are trickling in, I want to welcome you to our final uh, session of the conference, our plenary session of migration. And I'm going to start with uh, two words of thanks and one word of apology. So the first word of thanks is thank you to everyone for having come to this conference and thank you to everyone for having stayed to the end. We appreciate your participation. We appreciate having you here, so thank you. Our first word of apology, for those of you who looked online or might have seen this advertised earlier, um, Abebe Chimeles from the African Development Bank had to cancel at the last minute um, due to illness. And so that's our apology is, is, is um, the, the session is not as advertised. But the second word of thanks is going to be to Clément Pimbert, who volunteered um, as someone from the CSE to fill in with, with very short notice for our plenary. The speakers have assured me that what they want to do is to speak in the order of skilled migration, internal migration, and seasonal migration. And so we're going to, to stick to that pattern. We're going to have all three talks followed at the end by questions. We've got two people running around with microphones. But if you want to jump to the front of the queue, I also have my iPad and Twitter in front of me. So you can ask questions via Twitter. Uh, that's going to be hashtag CSAE2015. That's pound CSAE2015. So send questions if you have them. Um, I see no reason to keep stalling. So if you'd like to, to start. Can I stand over here and you hear me okay? Can you hear me in the back? Great. So I'm Michael Clemens. Thank you very much for inviting me here. In 20 quick minutes, I am going to sketch a fresh agenda for research on skilled migration and development. I'm going to do it by stitching together several papers, a few of them by me. So if you wanted to know what economists think about skilled migration and development, you might go to Google Scholar look up the most cited, most influential papers on this subject, and here's what you'd find. Uh, you would find that skilled migration is a loss to those left behind. You'd find that it's undoubtedly detrimental, that it's extremely detrimental in Africa, and that it's clearly above optimal levels. The most cited, most influential papers. Take a very dark view of skilled migration for sure. Now, something that all four of those papers have in common is a particular production function, and I'm going to use that to uh, stitch together a series of challenges that this older, more established, more influential literature has faced. This production function occurs in all four of the aforementioned papers, with different letters, of course. Uh, GDP per capita on the left-hand side is a function of some total factor productivity parameter theta times human capital in the country to a Cobb-Douglas exponent human capital in the country is the difference between H, total human capital stock that that country has, minus H star human capital that has left the country as skilled migrants. So a few challenges that this uh, uh, that work in, in this vein, making this particular assumption, has, uh, has faced. The first, historically speaking, was data. We didn't have good, good data 15 years ago to even measure uh, the extent of skilled migration. Um, Another, uh, maybe, let's say, 13, 15 years ago, uh, starting with the work of Andrew Mountford, Oded Stark, was a challenge to the specification of this production function. Um, maybe human capital stock is a function of the skilled migration through incentives created in the labor market for investment in human capital in order to reap the high returns to human capital abroad. Another challenge has been that uh, total factor productivity is a function of human capital uh, immigration through mechanisms such as technology transfer, another form of misspecification of this production function. Uh, yet another emerging from the last maybe 10, 15 years of the growth literature has been the idea that uh, there's a, even a more fundamental misspecification error with this production function, and it's that these variables are perhaps better modeled as simultaneously caused by, by emitted variables or, in fact, by growth itself. And a final challenge that 
rests perhaps in the public literature is uh, a, a, a closer consideration of the effects of policy on skilled migration and uh, perhaps unintended consequences. So I want to go through all of these, and I, I've put the top two in green because the literature has really made a lot of progress in those areas. The third in yellow because I think there's a, there's a lot left to do. And the last two in red because really the sky is just open. And if you're looking for uh, subjects, I want to uh, uh, encourage you to consider them. So let's start with data. Uh, as I mentioned, when, when work in this area began, uh, empirical work in this area began, it was hard to get any data on skilled migration. Now, thanks to pioneering efforts by Jean-Christophe Dumont, Frédéric Dauquier, and many who followed them, we now have quite good data, census-based data, on bilateral stocks of skilled migrants by skill level at different points in time. Now, when those numbers first came out, the reaction of the profession was something vaguely like, wow, those numbers are really big. Look at all of the skilled Liberians and skilled Haitians that are outside their countries. That must be really bad. Uh, I had quite a different reaction. Uh, some ideas I talk about in a paper called Do Visas Kill that I was pleased to present here at this conference eight years ago. And it was that those very numbers suggest that skilled migration per se is not a major determinant of skill stocks at the origin. And to show you what I mean, I just want to glance at some of the data. So here is a scatter of all countries on Earth where the horizontal axis is human capital outside the country of origin. The vertical axis is human capital inside the country of origin. That is, the, the horizontal axis is university graduates born and trained in the country of origin who are outside in an OECD country, so, so they show up in the census, divided by population at the origin. And the vertical axis is just number of university graduates in the country of origin per capita. So note well, in that naive production function, that zero-sum production function, movement in this space can only occur along a reference line of slope negative one that I've added to this graph. That's not a, re uh, a regression line, it's a, it's a reference line, uh, the yellow dotted line. One more skilled graduate outside the country means one less skilled graduate inside the country. Now those blue arrows are showing how these countries moved during the period 1990 to 2000, which is the only period during which it's possible to do exactly this calculation with existing data. And you don't see a lot of movement along that line. Even quite small countries, you can see here Jamaica, Tonga, uh, Fiji, Panama, are not moving along that line. They're moving in other complex ways. I'm going to drop the smallest countries in the former Soviet Union. Uh, the x-axis has uh, stretched out here, so that, that uh, yellow dotted line still has slope negative one. You're just not seeing a lot of movement along that line. In fact, if I drop the country labels so you can better see these arrows, you can see that there are only four arrows on this graph that have any negative slope at all, much less a, a, a typical slope of negative one. And for every arrow that has a negative slope, there are 10 that don't. So th this doesn't mean, obviously, that there is no mechanistic relationship at all when, when a skilled graduate gets on the plane, that's one fewer at home. But it does mean that as a quantitative determinant of the human capital stock, that simple mechanistic zero-sum relationship is getting overwhelmed by other things, just blown out of the water by other forces. So what are some of those forces? Well, one that we mentioned earlier is this idea that the prospect to emigrate might influence human capital investment and thus the, the stock of human capital at the origin. Emerging from theory, not testable for a long time for lack of data, uh, in a paper called uh, Skilled Migration and Skill Creation with Satish Chan, we take an empirical approach that uses a natural experiment. The natural experiment is in Fiji, and uh, to make a very long story short, Fiji is uh, very roughly speaking a bi-ethnic society divided between two ethnic groups, what Fiji Islanders themselves call Fijians, indigenous people, and Indians, or uh, Fiji Islanders of Indian origin. And starting in 1987, there was a series of military coups that Indians in Fiji perceived to greatly disadvantage their position in society. They started to leave en masse, and particularly skilled Indians relative to skilled Fijians. So here, uh, in 1986, the year before the first coup, and 1996, nine years later, at two census points, you can see the fraction of tertiary graduates by ethnic group, Indians in red, Fijians in blue, uh, before and after the coup. Just a gigantic uh, gap of 20 percentage points in the fraction 
who are outside the country, that is, in the showing up in the censuses of Australia and New Zealand, the two principal destinations. Um, Fiji is a small, poor, isolated island country. This is a gigantic, extremely rapid exodus of skilled, skilled workers. If there were to be a large impact on skill stocks at the origin per se from this kind of extremely rapid, large-scale movement, this is exactly where we would expect to see it. And this is what happened to skill stocks. So from full universe census data, this is the number of people in each ethnic group, Indians in red, Fijians in blue, who have tertiary education attainment. The Indians tracked exactly the Fijians during this period. And as we discuss in the paper, by looking at things like exactly what they were studying and mapping that to visa requirements for Australia and New Zealand, we argued that this huge and fully compensating entry into tertiary education was actually caused by the fact that these people were expecting to participate in the global labor market. So these forces are very real and they're very large. Um, that's labor market incentives. What about other <laughs> markets? So there's an exciting, quite recent literature suggesting that skilled, skilled immigrants are conduits for technology transfer in ways that could shape total factor productivity. I, I would highlight a fascinating paper in Restat by Bill Kerr of Harvard Business School, where he demonstrates this quite innovatively, showing uh, patent citations according to the uh, ethnic identity as embodied in the name of the people who are the names of the people who are citing patents across borders. It's been known for quite a while that international migrant networks foster trade. But it wasn't until recent work by Giovanni Peri and others that it's been known that skilled migrants in particular have a much larger effect. Same for capital flows as measured by foreign direct investment. It's been known for a while that migrant networks cause foreign direct investment. Recent research suggests a particular effect for skilled migrants. And a tantalizing uh, uh, recent and developing literature suggests that skilled migrant networks could even be a conduit for the transfer of things like institutions of democracy in Antonio Spielenbergo's AER paper and uh, fertility norms in the research of Michel Ben and others. Note well, all of these things uh, happen through migrant networks, whether or not the physical person ever goes home permanently. Now we're getting to bigger problems. The last 10 or 15 years of the growth and development literature uh, has had trouble detecting the causal relationship that is embodied, assumed by this naive zero-sum production function. That is, it, since the work of Holland Jones and Bills and Kleenow, this literature has had trouble detecting large effects of human capital accumulation on economic growth. In particular, uh, economists have had trouble detecting the large human capital externalities that are embodied in, in that assumed production function. So here I'm talking about the work of Ciccone and Peri and Ristad and many others uh, summarized by Lang and Topol's handbook chapter. Daron Ajimolu wrote a literature review last year in which he summarized this literature saying that the evidence we have is, quote, not compatible with human capital externalities of any significant magnitude, unquote. So what's going on? Well, a couple of AER papers last year used different methods to suggest that quality of education, actual learning, might be an important omitted variable here. Um, that uh, we're not comparing apples to apples when we're comparing university graduates from Niger to university graduates from France. That might help us make sense of the growth and development literature, but it's not good news for the zero-sum production function in the migration and development literature because if a skilled graduate leaves Niger, they leave with the quality of education that they received in Niger. And to the extent that that's low, that means that the effect on growth and development in Niger is less, not more. Another strand of this literature suggests that nonlinearities in the production function might be important. That is, not only might the production function not have the Cobb-Douglas form or even a linear form, but might look more like this, which some of you might re uh, recognize as the O-ring production function due to Michael Kramer. That is, there could be substantial range over which uh, the returns to scale are increasing. And that for countries with very low human capital, uh, the marginal return to human capital might be correspondingly low. Finally, uh, the entire migration and development literature emerged from the uh, international economics literature and the labor literature. And it has yet to seriously engage with the public economics literature when it comes to policy recommendations in this area. I want to uh, 
briefly mention one of those that I discuss in a paper called A Case Against Taxes and Quotas on Skilled Emigration, which is in the Journal of Globalization and Development. So for a lot of economists, notably early work by Jagdish Bhagwati in the 70s, uh, skilled migration is an open and shut case for Peguvian taxes and quotas. After all, skilled worker leaves a poor country, there is a negative externality exerted on that country, and a Peguvian tax or quota could internalize the externality, raise social efficiency. The problem with that line of reasoning is that Nobel laureate Ronald Coase uh, found half a century ago that 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 reasoning doesn't actually obtain necessarily. Specifically, he showed that when two parties to a, an externality cannot negotiate with each other due to high transactions costs, the socially efficient solution is for the entitlement to exert the externality to be vested in the party with the highest cost of mitigating the externality. And when we're talking about skilled migration, in general, that is definitely the migrant. It costs a lot more for a skilled migrant not to migrate from Malawi the income foregone could be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, typically, than it costs to train a new skilled migrant in Malawi. Um, that's under the case of high transactions costs, no negotiation, the socially efficient solution to entitle the migrant to migrate. A more uh, perhaps equitable way to arrive at the socially efficient solution, and Coase discusses this as well, is for policy interventions to be targeted at reducing those uh, transactions costs so that the parties can negotiate with themselves. In, the, in this case, that means migrants and the state negotiating up front for who's going to pay for the costs of education. And I discuss an institutional form that could lower transaction costs in that way for that purpose in a paper called Global Skill Partnerships, which is in the ISEA Journal of Labor Policy. So I want to close with some recommendations. Let me start by saying what I don't think we need more of. We really do not need more cross-country regressions based on census data that treats every university graduate as a lump, um, that makes heroic statements about causal relationships based on in instrumental variables that are uh, flimsy in the sense that they are uh, transparently invalid and perhaps uh, weak as well. Here are some things we really do need more of. We need a lot more movement from censuses to surveys to learn in detail about skilled migrants, what in fact they know, what they do after migration, how they interact with each other and their countries of origin. Uh, John Gibson and David McKenzie's paper in the EJ is a model in this regard where they did the hard work of collecting that data themselves. Um, we need to learn a lot more about the role that participating in the global labor market has in determining investment in human capital in the first place, how much people get and what forms they get. Um, natural experiments are a very promising approach here, championed in a great uh, handbook chapter by Mackenzie and Young. We need to learn a lot more about uh, these effects happening through other markets, how total factor productivity is, is shaped by these international linkages that skilled migrants form. I want to highlight a, a fascinating new paper by Danny Bahar and Hillel Rappaport, where they use product level data to suggest that skilled migrants change the range of products that countries are able to produce and export. That is, skilled migration can actually shape the comparative advantage of nations, something that is just so far beyond the naive zero-sum production function that uh, it, it really suggests uh, big things that are being missed. And finally, if you are young, brilliant, and courageous, and I know that many of you are all of those things, and you want to hunt the really big game in this literature, find a research design that can detect human capital externalities. Giovanni Peri and Dorona Ajimolo are extremely smart guys. If they can't find them, it means they're very hard to find. Uh, and you can make a gigantic contribution. The sky is open for you to make a really big contribution by finding a way to find them. It will have important uh, implications for this literature, as well as obviously uh, many other literatures. Mas and Moretti have an interesting uh, firm level approach that they talk about in the AER, but really the sky is open uh, for you here. As you write, I have a plea, and I want to close with this plea. Um, here's how I'm going to say it. Suppose I sent you this paper. Fresh new research by Michael Clemens. The family abandonment rate and child welfare. And in that paper, I define the family abandonment rate as 
the rate at which women work outside the home. You might email me back and say, Michael, what are you doing? It's very strange to use such pejorative, normative language in an ostensibly scientific and objective investigation of a phenomenon. Uh, wouldn't it be much better to just say what it is, female labor force participation in the child, uh, child welfare? Uh, neutral language like that would make it a lot easier for me to take your research seriously because it would suggest that you're not defining away women's rights in favor of the family's rights. It would suggest that you didn't arrive at the conclusion before even running any regressions, etc. If you crit criticized me in that way, you'd be right. So what then am I supposed to do with paper after paper in leading economics journals talking about brain drain, brain drain, brain drain? It, it's time to stop, it's time to drop this uh, normative, pejorative language. It's not scientific language. It was invented by nationalistic journalists in tabloid papers of the UK in 1963. It has no place in scientific discussion. And move forward with innovative methods and, and, and objective viewpoint, neutral scientific language. And uh, I, I honestly can't wait to read what some of you might write on this subject. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll now move on to our next speaker. Rather than questions, we'll do questions at the end. OK, well, thank you, Michael. That was a great start. And what we thought today uh, was to sort of spend three sessions talking about different components of migration decisions that people can make. So we've heard a little bit to start with about skilled migration, primarily international migration. And what I want to talk about now is what we know or what the questions that people are thinking about in terms of internal migration within a country. Uh, so I wanted to start by saying it's great to be here. I've really enjoyed the conference and the sessions I've seen. And thank you very much for the invitation to uh, talk. So why do we care about internal migration as well as international migration? And the fact is that many more people migrate within their country of birth then migrate across borders to other countries of birth. So the UN uh, estimates that one in eight people are internal migrants, and this is a rate of four times that of people who move across borders. And in particular, there are many international barriers or political barriers that stop people moving across from one country to another that usually don't exist within a country. Usually because some countries do put controls on where people can live and which people can move from where and to where, but if we're thinking about our models or understanding the choice to, that people make when they're thinking about where to work and where to live, thinking about migration within a country where there aren't usually legal barriers to movement is a really appealing way to start looking at this, sort of sidestepping the very complicated issues of how to get visas and international migration. So what I wanted to spend today talking about is we've compiled 18 censuses uh, from IPOMS. Uh, and these are the censuses that we could find that have internal migration data for countries in primarily sub-Saharan Africa. So what I wanted to think about were the answers to four questions. So at the moment, how many people are migrating? What jobs do migrants do? Are migrants able to find jobs or is it the case that migrants, uh, for example, have very high unemployment rates? And then the last one is where I want to sort of leave as an open question. So are there still arbitrage opportunities? And I want to come back to this and show sort of the puzzle that exists, not just in understanding internal migration within African countries, but also in understanding internal migration within the US and understanding these questions in just about any other country. So for example, we see the same sort of puzzle when we look at Brazil, we see the same sort of puzzle where we look at Indonesia, that in a country where people can move freely, there still exists very large differences in wages between two different regions in the same place. So why is it the case that people are not moving in order to equalize wages across space? And I'm going to sort of leave this as a question. I'll put up some hypotheses and some preliminary suggestions from other work, but I think this is really one of the big puzzles that people in development, people in urban, and people in geography are really trying to understand. Okay. So looking at the sample of uh, data for African countries that we pulled from IPOMS, and this is uh, with thanks to Alan Shaw, who's helped a lot with this work. 
I want to give uh, sort of answers to these four questions just to sort of set the stage. And lots of these questions have come up throughout the conference. So for example, in the session on agriculture, there was a lot of discussion about whether or not people have anything to do if they move off the farm. So I thought it was quite nice to make sure that we have a sense of the numbers first and then think about what sort of policies or policy relevant questions do these numbers raise. So migration rates are quite high. This is the, these are the 18 countries, and this is the migration rates of heads of households. Have you moved from the region that you were born in? And you can see, for example, in Malawi, close to 50% of people are living now in a region other than what they were born. Okay, uh, here, just a note, the, we've tried as much as possible to make regions comparable in size across countries, but the regional definitions are not always the same. So a country that has very high migration, it may be in this case that the regions are defined, for example, a little more smally, smaller than other locations. But what, you, what I want you to see here is that migration rates on average are about 30%. Somewhere like Malawi, there's very high levels of internal migration. Somewhere like Mali or uh, Egypt, there's relatively low levels of internal migration. But it is the case that people are moving. In some cases, people are moving a lot already. The second thing is to think about what do people do? So often in the literature, or often when we're thinking about migration, we have an idea that there are two places that people can be. People can be in the village or people can be in the city. You can be working in agriculture or you can be working in non-agriculture. And while this is true overall, there's a lot of heterogeneity in where people are moving from and where people are moving to. And so here I think there's a lot of work that's starting to look, instead of just these two locations, let's think more generally about in locations. Some regions are agricultural region, regions, some regions are urban regions. And what we see is a lot of movement from one rural area to another rural area. We saw, see a lot of movement from one urban area to another urban area. We also see reverse movements. So people who, for example, are born in urban areas who then migrate to agricultural or rural areas. So this links, thinks a little bit about this for the question of, is it the case that all of these people who are migrating are simply going to the city? So you can see that agricultural sectoral uh, involvement is quite high. Again, we can see it's about 50% on average. Uh, for three countries, we don't have uh, the classification of what sector people are working in. That's why they are missing at the top. So for example, in Rwanda, it's close to 85% of households, heads of households are working in agriculture. For a country like uh, Ghana, it's about 40%. This is what it looks like when we separate out by migrants and non-migrants. So what you'll notice is that although migrants are less likely to work in agriculture, many migrants are still working in agriculture. So you can see, for example, Rwanda here, when we separate out by non-migrants, about 95% are working in agriculture, but close to 80% of Internal migrants are also working in agriculture. So what this means is that there's a very complicated or much more uh, complex thing, system of how people are moving around. And when we're thinking about spatial models or we're thinking about models of structural change or we're thinking about questions of urbanization, we should also be thinking about the flows that are perhaps going within sector from one area to another area. So this here shows that for some countries, the gap is very uh, large. So for example, in Cameroon, you can see that there's a very large difference between the agricultural work of people who are migrating and people who are not. But I think as a sort of starting point, this makes the point that maybe many more migrants are actually still employed in rural areas, are still working in agriculture, than we might think without looking at the data. The next question that's come up several times is, why questions about farm size and what would be the benefit of, for example, perhaps increasing farm size if there aren't any job opportunities for people to go to. And so here, in order to capture this, again, to kind of set the scene for later conversations, we can look at what are the unemployment rates by migration status. So this is trying to address the concern that if there are no jobs for people when they move out of one rural sector, then perhaps we would see very high levels of urban unemployment or very high levels of unemployment rates for migrants. When we do this, you can see unemployment rates again are quite heterogeneous. So on average, it's about 20%. You can see in South Africa, it's close to 40%. Uh, in Rwanda, unemployment rates are about 10%. But when you break this up by migration status, there's not a lot of difference. So it's not the case that on average, migrants are much more likely to be unemployed than those who are not migrating. 
sometimes it's, it's the true, but sometimes it's the flip. So actually looking at South Africa, you can see that non-migrants actually have a substantially higher rate of unemployment than migrants. South Africa is a country with very low agricultural employment. Uh, but here again, I think it's a sort of fact to keep in the back of your mind that first, there are a lot of people moving, but it's not the case that all those people who are moving are simply unemployed and don't have anything to do. Unemployment rates seem to be roughly equal between migrants and non-migrants, again, depending on country. And then I want to get to the piece that is a bit of a puzzle for people who are trying to understand the decisions to migrate. And this is to think about what are the returns to migrating. So when you would write down a model of migration, a large component or a large part of the decision about why you should migrate somewhere would be thinking about the income that you could earn if you stayed where you are and thinking about the income that you could earn if you moved to a place like a city or maybe a more productive agricultural location. And in sort of the most simple framework that you could think here, you would see a high wage. The high wage would attract a lot of people. As many people move to that location, we would have downward pressure on wages. And if there were no barriers to migration, there was no heterogeneity across people, we should expect that people should migrate until wages are equal everywhere. And therefore, when we look at the distribution of wages, there should be very little difference. Of course, you can think about stories, and I'll come back to some of the explanations, Things like cost of living, you can think about quality of life differences, you could think about some stories about selection, about the types of people that move to places. But the basic underlying theory it should be that we can arbitrage our labor across space if there aren't external or specific barriers. And so we should expect that we should see very little wage dispersion. But as I'll show you, there's a lot of wage dispersion across space, and it's not just rural urban wage differences. So this is uh, something that comes up in the literature that's often termed the agricultural productivity gap, which is looking at the N equals two case. So looking at the agriculture versus non-agriculture sector, you often see that output per person are, is about three times higher in at the non-ag sector than the ag sector. What I'll show you is that if we just look at the income that people are earning across different regions in the same country, the difference between the region that's at the 90th percentile of the distribution and the region that's at the 10th percentile of the distribution is often about a factor of three. So what that could mean is that, or what the question it raises is, can you take someone who's living and earning the average wage in that region that's getting the 10th percentile wage, could you relocate that person to the 90th percentile region? And in that way, would you end up increasing the average wages of the person who you're moving? So in order to understand the gaps, what we want to understand first, what causes these gaps? And I'll show you these gaps that exist in a couple of countries. And then why isn't it the case that people are, given that people are moving, why isn't it the case that people are migrating enough to equalize wages across space? So this is what the data looks like for Kenya. Here I take household income. This is uh, from a compilation database uh, by the FAO. And what I show here is I collapse uh, average household income by district, and then this is a histogram of average income by each of the districts in Kenya. And so you can see there's a lot of variance in the distribution, and the two red lines are the 90th percentile, where the unit of observation is the region, and the 10th percentile. So here, the 9010 income, income gap is about 2.7. So bear in mind, this is the thought experiment. Could you move people from these regions where on average wage is very low, up to these regions in their same country where wages are high and therefore could you increase income and perhaps increase productivity. This is just geographically what it looks like. Here, this is again a kind of an argument for why we should think a little bit more than just N equals two. In countries, there are many regions. There's a lot of heterogeneity on which areas have high wages. It's not the case that it's only the urban cities, for example, that have the highest wages. You often see places that have very high wages right next door to very low wages. So there's a lot of spatial heterogeneity in where people are earning high wages or which areas are highly productive. Okay, so this is what it looks like for Kenya. This is what it looks like for Malawi. Here again, this is uh, plotting by district. And the 90-10 income gap for Malawi is about 2.3. This is what it looks like on the map. So again, there's a lot of spatial heterogeneity. So you see the side-by-side -side places that are very have very high average incomes next to places that have very low average incomes. I should say the darker colors here are the ones, the top quartile of the wage distribution, and the lighter colors are the ones with less incomes. 
And this is what it looks like for Tanzania. Here, the 1910 income gap is about 4.3. So this is a case where there's very large regional differences in incomes that people are earning that leads us to think, or at least want to understand, why is it that an equilibrium, given that people can move around the country, what is it that causes these wage gaps to persist? Okay, and here's what it looks like uh, visually. So I think this is where we can come back and think about what would economic theory say, and then also from a policy side, what might be the right policy response to the fact that there's so much heterogeneity. And the idea here is that when we're thinking about how to allocate the resources that we have in a country, it's not only the quantity of resources that you have, so for example, not only the number of people or the amount of capital, it's also how you choose to put those people. So is it the case that you are having people working in the areas where they are going to be most productive? Or is it the case that you perhaps have many people working in places which are relatively less productive and you could improve income levels by helping people to get a better match for their certain skills and earn a higher income than where they are right now? So here what I want to think in mind is how or what do we need to know to go from looking at these dispersion or pictures of dispersion to thinking about whether or not this means that we should be encouraging more migration. And here, I don't have an answer to this question. This is a very active question. I'll give you some thoughts about what economists are studying. But again, I think this is something that uh, there's some very preliminary and exciting experimental research underway, but the questions are really fundamental and really uh, still a really puzzling uh, question. So here, given these large wage gaps in a country, why do we not see more people migrating? And do these gaps perhaps represent an exploitable policy opportunity to help people leave low-income places and go to high-income places? So for example, at an individual level, could we give someone, by moving them spatially, a higher wage? And then for an aggregate level, given that we think and we know that nominal wages reflect productivity, could we increase the productivity of a whole country by helping better allocate people to where they are they have the skills for certain uh, production. And here, the key is first to understand why these gaps exist. So there's been several uh, sort of explanations. One is simply a story of selection. So this takes, for example, the rural urban wage gap, or it takes, for example, the gap between agriculture and non-agriculture. And it would say the reason that people in cities earn more than people in the rural areas is that all the people who are well-educated move to cities. Therefore, we do see these big differences, but it's not reflecting an actual gap that we could exploit because a person who chooses not to move is someone who has less human capital. So if we took that person and put them in the city, they wouldn't actually earn that higher wage. Okay, so this is the argument that would say these gaps are efficient because they're reflecting returns to, for example, human capital that people have accumulated. So that's one possibility. A second possibility, and this is one that, particularly in urban economics, that people think about, that I think is also relevant for thinking about how people migrate internally in developing countries, is thinking about the fact that people care more than about just wages. So often this is referred to as compensating differentials, and it's the idea that you care about the quality of life that you have in a place, as well as the wage that you earn. Maybe you really like the weather, so you're very happy to live somewhere where you're by the beach. You would be happy to take a lower wage to live by the beach because you also get some utility from living in a beautiful place and having nice weather. So the idea could be that the reason that we see these wage gaps across space is that the places that have low wages must have high average amenities so that in terms of utility, people are exactly indifferent. And so this is also potentially policy relevant, thinking about if it's the case that you want people to be in places that are more productive and perhaps there's pollution issues or perhaps there are things that make the city not very enjoyable, this is also potentially something that you could think about influencing through policy. And here amenities, I haven't put it up explicitly, but you could think about amenities also uh, including, for example, congestion costs and sort of inside that you could map to, for example, costs of living or things that scale up or down with more people coming in. And then the third one is uh, the focus of a couple of papers that I've been working on recently, which is thinking that it might be costly for people to move. So for example, when we look in Brazil, we see that when places get close to randomly connected to national highways, we see a change in the decisions of where people are migrating, how far they're migrating, and how responsive they are in 
when there are economic shocks. So the idea here is that perhaps something like the lack of infrastructure, perhaps linguistic differences, perhaps anything that makes it costly to perhaps move from your home to another place within a country might mean that you know that there are wage differences that you could get, but because it's costly for you to go from A to B, you're choosing not to migrate. And therefore, if we wanted to think about improving the migration, we could think about what we could do to change the cost of migration. So for example, this might be a case that if you think about the benefits of connecting two places by road, it wouldn't only be the case that it makes it easier for physical goods to be traded, it could also lower the migration costs of people moving. And especially if people have friends and family that come and they want to be able to go backward and forward from, say, the city back to the village to visit friends and family, it's going to matter if it's five hours versus 20 hours to go backward and forward. So these are some questions, it's very, or possible explanations, it's very difficult to disentangle these. And I think you could have debates about exactly which one of these, and people, there is a, a very active and recent debate in the literature uh, that, about exactly which one it is. So in work that I have done with uh, Gary Bryan at LSE, we find evidence of both selection, amenities, and the cost of migration. So I think rather than taking a stance that is one or only one of these frictions, I think what we have to think about is that all of these different components can potentially contribute towards understanding these wage gaps across space. And then we want to think about understanding, for example, the role of costs and which of those are the ones that are potentially policy relevant. And so this is where I think there is a role for more and exciting research to try and understand, first, do these wage gaps represent an, un an a possible uh, policy, a potential, uh, potential policy uh, exercise where we could think about ways in which we could help people move to places which have a better match for their labor. So uh, Clement is going to talk about seasonal migration. And I think one very promising study, for example, looked at exactly doing this. So providing random incentives for people to migrate in a time where there's a lot of seasonality and not very much work locally. And so the question here is if you induce people to migrate randomly, and the explanation is that all of these wage gaps are coming from selection, then we should see that these migrants who weren't migrating don't end up doing very well when they go to the city. In fact, this study found the opposite. So when you did help people migrate who hadn't been migrating, they had an increase in income of about 30%, and then they kept on migrating in the future by themselves uh, in the off season uh, in order to kind of take advantage of this extra income. So here I think we should think as we understand and as we try to work out what's going on with this dispersion of gaps in the same country, and we see already that there are people moving should we think about policies that encourage more migration? And if so, what might be some of the spillover effects that we have to think about? And then sort of as a flip to that, perhaps policies that are focusing on improving low productivity areas, so for example, policies that are space-based, agricultural subsidies, they might have a sort of side effect that what they're doing is making it easier for people to stay in low productivity places, where perhaps part of the cheaper answer or part of a larger kind of program might be exactly about helping people to get to the location which has the best match for their skill. So I think here, there's a lot of really interesting data. The kind of take home points is that people are moving a lot. There's a lot of rural to rural, there's a lot of agriculture to agricultural migration. And this question of do, do these wage gaps represent a policy opportunity, I think is still one that's potentially very exciting and a lot of uh, questions that still need to be answered on the academic side. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does it work? Yeah, okay. Um, um, so, um, since uh, since we're in Oxford and I'm from Oxford, I'm, I'm going to have a, take a, a rowing uh, analogy. So in, in rowing races in Oxford, there's always these boats who sign up at the last minute. Um, they're not quite, they don't really have the same level of, as the others. And they put in the end so that they don't really disturb the, the boats that come after them. <laughs> but but, but they're, they're also really enjoy being here. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm the beer boat of this conference. I'm <laughs> very happy to be here. So um, basically what I'm going to talk about 
uh, is, is seasonal migration. So you, you may think about it as a subset of this internal, mi internal migration that uh, Melanie has been talking about. I think in some contexts uh, it, may, it may also be an, an internal, international seasonal migration. Um, uh, so um, this is a, 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 I guess, I'm not an agenda setter here. I'm just, you know, one of the player. And I, I think if you want to join me and work on seasonal migration, it's a great topic and an interesting one where there are, there are high returns to data and your, and your research. Um, and the and flip side on this is that um, my own work is in India, and I have uh, not close to nothing to say about, about Africa. And I hope you will. Um, so uh, let's start by 19th century France. Um, this quote has been given me by uh, Julien. So from peasants to Frenchmen, so it's about 19th century France. It's saying that in the high Alps, uh, winter blockaded families for six months a year. To the end of the 19th century, most men, women, children, and beasts had to, had to leave that half year out, crowded together in the stable. Here, the, the excerpt I took out is like when they're, they're basically sleeping with their pigs and all this, so I, I didn't want to, to add that. Uh, in such conditions, one person less to breathe the air, take a bed space, or consume scarce food made a contribution to the family's well-being, even if the migrant brought back no cash at all. So it's kind of a very, uh, very stark quote, obviously. Um, but what I get from this is that this, this seasonal migration may be important when there's a large fraction of the labor force uh, that depends on agriculture, and I think obviously that arguably that's it's the case uh, uh, in many developing countries. And labor demand in agriculture is seasonal, and so there's, there's always a lean season, an off season where there's little, little work to do. And so um, in the lack of employment, local employment opportunities, uh, you know, in some obviously some, some rural areas there's some uh, non-farm employment to do, but in, in, in many there isn't. Um, uh, households don't really have the resources, the savings uh, to smooth the consumption perfectly. So there's, there's this, what's been called the, the seasonal famine or seasonal hunger, and that's what's driving migration. So it's very, very much a kind of a, a push story. Um, so uh, migration for, migrating for part of the year may be an important coping strategy for rural households. Here there should be a, a, a Morton quote on this because Melanie is, uh, uh, has an important paper on, on, on migration as part of the, one of the ways that uh, households uh, ensure themselves. Um, and so unlike, I think, long-term migration, returns to short-term migration may not be very high. And here, so here I don't take a strong stance. The, the truth is we, we, don't, we don't really know. Uh, the, the, the basic idea is that if, if the outside option well, of staying at home is like, is like zero, they, they, they may be very keen to, to take, some, take up something, even if the, 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 the net returns are not, not so high. So I'll, I'll say a bit about this, but not so much. So um, again, I'm going to talk about, about India. Um, apologies for that. Uh, there are three, um, there are three third surveys we can draw from, and uh, it's like a, 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 so it's it's going in. So the first is national representative data with very little detail. The red survey is still representative, much much more, but uh, a, a much smaller sample. And the right survey is some uh, data that's been collected by uh, my my, my co-authors uh, in in a couple of villages, and there we know a lot more. So I'm going to uh, liberally draw from all these samples and just give you a couple of uh, uh, descriptive statistical or, you know, uh, uh, characteristics of the seasonal migrants. And I think the, the, the first thing that you need to know is that those, those guys are definitely the, the poorest of the poor. Their um, they're, they're, you know, uh, education levels, it's completely the other end of the scale, so they're very un unskilled, they're small versus... Uh, big, big landowners, uh, and they, they often migrate as, uh, as, as, as groups. And so um, maybe this, just, just this very simple descriptive statistics may, may tell you that it's, a, it's a quite a different phenomenon from uh, definitely the, the, maybe part of the international migration and internal migration, where that we, we usually think of as being, you know, this, this very high returns thing that you want to accumulate for a long time, and maybe uh, only the, the larger land, landowner, or you, you have some, some level of wealth that you need to get access to this migration. Here, these guys really uh, uh, are, are, very, are very poor. Uh, where, where are they migrating from? So there's almost no uh, urban seasonal migrants, so it's all rural seasonal uh, migrants. And, and importantly, and I think here it's, it's basically an artifact of what we measure. So when you ask the question, have you left your village uh, and have you come down the, back during the, the same uh, uh, the same year, we capture this as seasonal, but there's some people who are just commuting during the day, right? So here is maybe the tip of the iceberg in terms of people moving from, uh, 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 moving to some non-farm employment opportunities in urban areas, but it's this tip of this iceberg are those people who are like far enough that, that, that they actually need to stay, uh, uh, stay at destination. Um, I think the, uh, yeah, um, so 
where, where are they migrating to? I think there's, uh, there, there are two, uh, as so Melanie was, was emphasizing the fact that you have uh, a lot of migration uh, to rural areas, and that's happening as well in, the, in, in India in the seasonal migration. Part of the, those migrants are actually, uh, you know, uh, leaving agriculture to go into agriculture. It's just that there are, you know, uh, different seasons in different, uh, in different cli agroclimatic zones. So you do have some uh, rural to rural migration, but most of it is, is rural to urban. Um, I think, um, so these, these migrants are mig migrating quite far, uh, 300, 400 kilometers on average, and that's where uh, the remote uh, thing has, has to be taken is a, with a grain of salt. Remote means that you're quite far from a town, but these guys seem to be connected uh, with via a network of, of railways and, and roads. Um, and, and that, that may be the, the hint of what's, what's going on here. These guys are, are, quite, are quite poor, but with the railways, you can go very far without having to pay so much. So the, the cost, the marginal cost of going one kilometer more uh, is, not, is, not that, is not that high. Um, the other thing is, uh, it's important, and here I don't want to, to generalize, I just have some, some data on this, but uh, it seems both, both recruitment at destination and origin seems to be going on. And uh, if I had to really, uh, uh, simplify this. There are some people who just go to a very big town to find construction work, and they don't need to know the employer before. They just they just show up on the spot market, and they, they find the, the, the employees there. The other extreme are like, for example, brick factories, which are in the middle of nowhere. And there, to get there, you really need to, to have the contact with the employer. So there's a middleman who's come and kind of hired you from your village itself. Um, and so that's that's a bit that kind of these two sectors have in mind: construction and small scale manufacturing. Um, uh, you know. I've, there, there may be other things going on, but those are like the two, the two big types uh, um, I, I have. So um, this is a, 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 a sample of uh, villages in India. Uh, this is a random sample of villages in India. It's only 241 villages, however. There are about 600,000, so it's a small sample. That's the red survey, uh, R-E-D-S, and it's, it's from in 2006. So those are the villages that were surveyed, and, and in blue, uh, those are the villages where uh, there's at least one seasonal migrant. So at least one person who said, yes, I've been away from the uh, village for work during the last year, and I've obviously come, come back. And here, I think that that's just to make the point that those are, uh, this is not a very widespread phenomenon. As in it's, it, if, you, if you have a very small sample, you may miss them. Or if you sample in, in some states, for example, the southern states, you may find no, migra no seasonal migrants at all. And the seasonal migration is very concentrated in those this, uh, north, uh, northeastern parts of, of India that are, quite, that are quite poor, where people are quite desperate, where you know, there's no irrigation. And so the, the, the agricultural season is very, is very, is very short. So uh, many people are, are migrating there. What I found fascinating just drawing this map is then when you, when you look at the destination, well, the, those green, uh, those, those green uh, points, uh, that, that's uh, you know, manufacturing India. Oh, that's, that's urban India com coming, coming here. Uh, you, know, you have Gujarat and Maharashtra, and all those big, these big manufacturing clusters. You may also have some uh, rural destinations as well in agriculture. Um, and so here, to make the point that, that these people are um, they don't seem to be so much so constrained by the cost of transportation. Um, if you, if they were, if they, given that how poor they are, uh, if they are very constrained by, if transportation is very costly, they should be the, the, the blue guy, the, the blue, from the blue point dots, they should be going to the nearby green dots, right? And so here I'm just drawing the, the trips that these guys make, and that, that, that tells you that it's, it's not all the case. So these guys are going all over the place. And um, I'm not going to go into details, but I can tell you the train lines that those guys are, are taking here, right? So, so here it's it's very fascinating uh, a phenomenon because these these uh, very poor people uh, uh, living in very remote areas are, are migrating very far uh, to get some to, to, to get to get some work. Um, so, with the the, the, the time I have, I have left, I, w I, I I wanted to talk a bit about policy because. Uh, we can sort of coordinate it with Melanie. So uh, she was talking about the, the kind of policy interventions uh, that, that governments could implement. Uh, because as economists, we think that this type of thing is good because those are you know, uh, very poor people getting uh, 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 nice employment opportunities at the time where, they, where, where they're needed. And so one, one policy response may be to facilitate or encourage this, this type of migration. And so the, the, the RCD uh, from, uh, uh, sorry, the, the experiment of uh, Brian Chaudhary and, and Mubarak is exactly this. So subsidizing uh, the trip, trip to town for uh, a rural uh, Bangladesh households. 
Um, but uh, I've been, I happen to, to have studied uh, a policy that's doing exactly the opposite. And it's not, it's not just an experiment, it's, it's a very, very large policy. And so the Indian government seemed to have thought otherwise and thought that maybe what they, 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 they needed to do was to provide alternative employment for rural households during the off-season of agriculture. Right? And I, I, I know the Indian government is not the only one, and there, there, there are many such uh, programs going on in Africa, for this, this, this much I know. So, um, so here, the, 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 the Indian government is providing public employment to about 50 million uh, households, these are official figures, but uh, here the idea is that the, the, uh, the government is giving a guarantee of work to rural households and organizing some, some public works, some public infrastructure, uh, uh, projects so that people, you know, literally, you know, don't don't have to go go away. They do have something locally, and so um, we find, and that's the way I pitched it to you. So you may not be surprised that the, this program, this workfare program, is actually reducing short-term migration. Right. So you could have, could have very different things going on uh, by adding some additional income. Maybe uh, that could have helped uh, financing migration. But what we really do see is that when you give to households, to those rural poor households, something else to do during their, their, their lean of agriculture rather than migrating, they, they take it and they stay and they stay back. Uh, you could have the, the same insurance story. Uh, you have a, you know migration is a risk scoping strategy. Here the government is providing some social insurance, some public insurance. So that that's, it's crowding out migration. But what's surprising, and if you look at the numbers, and I, so I have uh, uh, this is about like kind of two, two papers there uh, that I have with, with John, John Papp. Uh, if you look at the numbers, so if you look at uh, uh, what's the wage that, um, that people get on this public employment program, and what's the wage when they, that they get uh, on average when they, when they migrate, um, you, you, you have very large differences, right? So people seem to be ready to stay back for 60 rupees rather than go for 110. Okay, so um, if this, this, this short-term migration is, is, uh, is so much worth it, why are they, you know, foregoing it? Why are they uh, uh, neglecting it and, and, and dropping it when they're, once they're given uh, something to do in the village, but that's paying much less than what they would get uh, in urban areas? And so here, there may be different explanations, and then we try to, we try to tease them out and, and put some numbers on it. So obviously, you know, risk may be, may, may be an aspect of it. So you show up in the, in, the, in, in the urban areas, but the wages are not, not as high as you thought, right? And we actually do find a lot of variation between people, but also for the same person going for you know, different seasons, they actually end up getting uh, different wages. So risk is one, one thing. The difference in living cost is another. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that these guys are actually sleeping on the pavement, so it's not the difference in rent, so it's, it's going to be mostly, you know, maybe the food, or this kind of thing. But at the end of the day, you get a, a large residual uh, cost of migration that has to do with just people really loathe, really don't like uh, sleeping on the pavement for three months and leaving the village and, and you know, uh, uh, having the risk of maybe uh, getting injured on an on a urban construction site. Uh, but th those are, those are, I mean, you know, those are very preliminary results, and we, we don't really know, and that's, that's going tying back to the idea that we don't really know what the net returns of this, uh, of this migration is. So uh, 110 rupees rather than 60 rupees sounds good, but people uh, seem to think otherwise. So we need to, we need to know what's, what's going on there. Um, another uh, important result we have is that we, we find that wages, uh, because of this drop in migration, uh, uh, from rural to urban areas, urban wages seem to be increasing. And so urban areas that are most exposed to drop in migration inflow, which is seasonal migration inflow, are experiencing high increase in wages. And I think uh, uh, the magnet is, well, this result may not be so surprising. What's surprising is maybe the magnitudes. And they're just the magnitudes themselves tell you that there, those seasonal migrants, there are about 8 million of those seasonal migrants every year in India. And if you count the number of urban residents who do the same kind of work, it's about 14 million. So that just tells you that those seasonal migrants, those rural migrants, are actually quite important as in terms of influx of labor force, uh, of labor for, for urban areas. So if, if you're a government, uh, probably you know, uh, well-minded, and you, you want to, to, to reduce to, to, uh, this uh, distress migration, you think it's a hard little thing to do for people to, to, to sleep on the pavements for three months, so you give them something else to do in the countryside, but that means that these guys are not going to urban areas. In urban areas, there are some um, employees who are like, you know, waiting for them and uh, complaining definitely about the rise in, la in labor costs. So, and, yeah, so that's the, the kind of the policy trade-off. Okay, um, and so there's, yeah, uh, yeah so that's, that's the elasticity of urban wages with respect to migration is large. That's, that's the same idea. So um, I'll just, I just close here. Um, uh, what I want to take, 
take from this just seasonal migration is not widespread, so you won't find it everywhere. Uh, I think, I think uh, you know, internal migration or, or people uh, settling, settling, settling in, in, in for leaving the village and settling in, in cities, that's something you, you'd find, you'd probably find everywhere, everywhere you'd look. The seasonal migration seems to be uh, very concentrated in some areas that are very poor, that with, with this, this, this high seasonality in agriculture, uh, that are very remote, so they, they can't just commute to the next town, but they do have some, some you know, connection so they do. So in my case, I think the, the railways, the railways are very important. So they do have some connection with this, with these jobs they could get. Um, another thing that that I think I know, uh, just because I have two data points, uh, is is in France uh, there are two censuses uh, that have been done in the middle and the end of the the 18 uh, of the 19th century. And there's there's uh, Gilles Postel Vinet uh, and and, and co-authors who have been working on the on the censuses. And what they show is that they really find evidence of the seasonal migration, the seasonal labor markets uh, 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 phenomenon in the middle of the 19th century, but by the end of the 19th century, it's, it's all gone, okay? So you may, think, you may think of seasonal migration as a specific stage in the, in the process of development where a lot of people are stuck in the countryside, if you may, and then there are lots of job creation in, in non-farm employment opportunities somewhere in, in urban areas, but they haven't, made the, they haven't made the move. So maybe at some point, seasonal migration disappears, it's permanent migration, and then there's, 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 no, more, there's no more seasonally. Um, and um, and it's a, I think it's a phenomenon that governments uh, uh, care about. Uh, as I, I mentioned, one very large anti-poverty programs that reduce distress migration, and uh, crazy economists are thinking of you know, interesting interventions we could have to, to get the, help those people go and, 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 and benefit from, uh, relocate, from re relocating, at least uh, temporarily, to, to urban areas. And I, I have to, to say, we, we know very little about it, and uh, that's, uh, 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 when, I, when I sent this slide to, to Julia Coffey here, uh, she said, uh, are you sure you didn't forget the, the content? Unfortunately, I, I didn't, so, <laughs> so I, I just thought, <laughs> I, I just thought I'd, I'd ask you the question before you ask it uh, to me. So, um, so I, yeah, the, the answer is we, we have really little data and, and little information and very little uh, work is done on seasonal migration in Africa. So, um, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'll leave it there. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. We have about 25 minutes for questions. And as we've been doing them before, I think it works well to take them in groups of three. We've got two people running with microphones, one and two. Um, but I'm going to start with what's not a question. Rather, I'm following a conversation between a few people on Twitter. And this might be a dangerous idea to ask this, but someone mm -hmm. pointed out, out, in Kenya, people are poor. Possibly a more nuanced statement would have been better, um, followed by um, good points about the language we use. Now, you made a very clear point about uh, the brain drain <coughs> being a loaded term. Beyond that, to what extent would you say that loaded language or incorrect language leads us to misframe debates about migration? And that's, I guess, to the whole panel. But let's collect two other questions as well. Please ask questions. We've got one. Thank you. My name is Nadej from the African Development Bank. I have a, a small question. Uh, during your presentation, I have not heard about uh, those who are forced to migrate, for instance, from fragile state, and we know that in Africa we have this issue, and also those who are forced to forced to migrate uh, because of climate change. How do you, what, what, what are your thoughts about it? And another or should we turn it over? All right, we'll turn this over to. Would you like me to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I don't have any evidence, scientific evidence, about the effect of, uh, of, uh, of language on how people think. Uh, there, are some, there are three fascinating psychology papers doing RCTs on how believable people find statements. Uh, 
uh, if you if you convey the exact same information but say it with a rhyme, people rate it as being more believable. And I, I, I'm not kidding. There, 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 there's even a, a name for this effect that escapes me because I'm not a psychologist. But uh, people tend to assume that you know something said with a rhyme must be a proverb that's been handed down, and people wouldn't take the trouble to repeat it unless it were true. Um, what, what bothers me about the, the term brain drain is exactly what bothers me, uh, uh, what would bother me about a crazy term like, uh, like the family abandonment rate or calling tariffs something like the patriotic commerce charge. You know, it, it, it embodies a certain view of the world in which uh, a certain policy is good and other policies are bad. And uh, uh, some of my best friends are skilled migrants. My wife is a skilled migrant. Uh, there are all kinds of complexities to the decisions that people make, the reasons that they make them that are not captured by a term that just defines uh, a certain economic decision to be negative. It's something that we wouldn't accept in, in any other setting. Imagine a trade paper that talked about the patriotic commerce charge. You wouldn't even take trouble to read it. It's probably coming from some, uh, some uh, flimsy research institution. Uh, but somehow this, this idea of brain drain that embodies uh, uh, harm and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, 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 a simplistic mechanistic relationship that, is, that recent research is, is uncovering uh, is, is, is not to be found in the real world has, has taken hold even of the scientific literature. And I, I think it's time to, to move on both, both terminologically and substantively from that view. Yeah, um, it's just on the language, so in my context, I think uh, uh, things like distress migration or instead of seasonal migration, or, so you, you do hear a lot of or hunger migration, famine migration, so you do have a lot of those kind of words that are used for seasonal migration and that, uh, that basically just pushing for uh, you know, government intervention to, to, put it, uh, to put a stop to it. Uh, I think if we, uh, we could describe this, the same kind of seasonal migration in a, a very positive an angle, saying that, you know, how cool is that, that those, those guys coming from uh, the, the middle of, of nowhere uh, are going to the Himalayas to pick apples for just three months and are coming back. Uh, uh, there, there are things that are about seasonal migration that are just amazing, and I've just heard that there, there's some Thai workers from Thai, workers from Thailand going to, to Sweden to pick berries. So it's, 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 a, it's a wonderful achievement if you want to put it like that. Obviously, uh, this distress migration of these ideas uh, uh, also reflect the fact that it, uh, people are pushed away uh, uh, by the lack of employment opportunities at home. Um, I just wanted to say something about climate change because you, you brought it up. I think um, there, there is some work, uh, I think Jan Ozebo that was uh, presenting something uh, today about uh, this kind of uh, temporary migration is in response to flooding in Vietnam. Uh, uh, you know, so, so there's a typhoon, there's flooding, and people uh, go and, and do these temporary trips uh, to, to, to the city and get, get some work, uh, rem it back, uh, and, then, and then come back. Uh, and that, that seems to be a very, uh, this, this uh, temporary, so what, what he finds is like the, really this temporary migration seems to be very effective at raising, temporarily raising money and helping people, uh, uh, households move through these shocks. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a really as a risk coping. So here, seasonal migration as a risk coping strategy. You could have a, a longer view of you know risk mitigation, like migration, maybe permanent migration, as you know, uh, sending migrants in, in different places that are not exposed to the same kind of shocks as a risk mitigation strategy. So you know, before the shock happens. I'm sure. Yeah, I see. So I, uh, I think that the. Uh, both uh, very important questions. So the question about forced migration and refugees, I think uh, economists are starting to study this, but one of the complicated uh, reasons or things that had to study is people are not making a choice. And so often when you think about understanding decisions, the first thing you start with is what would people choose to do and why are they making the decision that they do? In the case of uh, forced migration or people who have become refugees, clearly it's not a choice and as a result, I think a lot at the moment of the research is focusing more on rather than why did people choose to go to where they did because obviously here they didn't choose, what happens when perhaps you have a lot of people who suddenly enter another country or suddenly enter a labor market, what might be the spillovers, what might be the sort of, you could think about effects for example on the local labor economy, you could think about spillover effects in terms of 
on the amenity side, you could think about agglomeration side. And there I think, uh, so I know one of my colleagues uh, at Stanford, Rana Bermiski, is working very hard to start a series of panel data sets with the idea of collecting panel data from refugees and different refugee camps with the idea of trying to trace out what has the economic reality for people who are living outside the country not by choice, what things are changing over time, for example, what happens with children, education, what happens to <coughs> later migration moves. Uh, but I think at the moment there's not a, a lot on the data side that we have to sort of inform uh, what, what's happening and what are some of the outcomes. I think on the second, on climate change, I think that's also very important because I think it's also going to be the case that it may or may not be, you can think about it perhaps being initially a choice, but I think many models of what happens is going to be that certain countries are going to be very much affected and other countries won't be. And I think here the political economy of which countries are going to allow people to move in and which countries might not and how this gets resolved I think is going to become very important because there's going to be a lot of distributional effects based on the places that are projected to have the most detrimental effects on climate change. So perhaps for short term, you can think about people responding on short term effects. When these shocks become more permanent, I think it's impossible to imagine the sorts of restrictions that might start to uh, be imposed on people moving and how much of this is going to generate some distributional effects I think is really important. And definitely the, the migration angle here. People. Uh, so Desmond and Rossi Hansberg have some work looking a little bit at trying to simulate out how people might be moving around, but I think there's going to be many policy debates about this and then very many economic debates uh, based on where people are born and what sort of effects they're going to have from climate change. I think it's very important. And both of these things, I think, are not anywhere near as studied as they should be, and so both are very important. All right, thank you. I have another question from Twitter that's phrased just at Melanie, but I think would work for the entire panel. Migrant, non-migrant earning differences. How does what we see within Africa or within developed countries compare to the gaps that we see within rich countries? Is this at all just a development phenomenon or just something about developing countries? So that's question one. I see a second person who'd like to ask one. So my question is, again, to Melanie. Uh, when you talk about the cap in, in wages, I was expecting that you would, you would also talk about proper, pro, property rights on agri agricultural land. Because if I migrate and I lose my land, then I have a disincentive to migrate. And Again, if I migrate and I cannot buy land where I go, I have a disincentive to do permanent migration. And the second thing I thought you would talk about is information. We economists know that there is a difference in wage between that region and this other region. Is it possible that people do not know that 500 kilometers away the wages are higher? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for your, your talks. I thought they were very informative, especially on uh, giving us some ideas about uh, um, how to go move forward with research, especially like on the topic of human um, capital and externalities. I, I was very curious on something very similar. If there are any studies on, uh, on uh, the, the positive impact of uh, this brain drain phenomenon, maybe something you, we could look at from a perspective of uh, of a brain constipation versus brain diarrhea kind of argument, <laughs> where, <laughs> where we would where we would try to where we would try to see if because imagine the, my argument is that we the world is a global pool right we have like a global pool of resources from which countries countries are strategically picking picking and we can really see this in the academic research sector that you would notice that most of the leading research institutions do not have uh, their researchers from that location. You know, everybody is being pulled away from, you know, their countries of origin. So maybe this, I don't know if you have ideas of any papers that kind of look at it from this perspective and we can get, we can get information on this quite easily because obviously the, the bio data of professors in all the universities is kind of available. So we can be able to track where they are from and we can know, you know, 
maybe the countries from where they were from, you know, I don't know whether they are gaining or losing. But then imagine if a country did not export unused capacity and it kept it in. That would be the brain constipation argument. Is it better for this country? <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. Do Uh, okay, so let me start with at least the two. Well, uh, the last question, I think I will uh, be happy to hear your thoughts. <laughs> uh, so the question about is this just a development phenomenon? And I think very clearly the answer is no. And this is why I think it's a very interesting question because you see similar uh, wage gaps in the US. Uh, and there, I think there's a lot of sort of patterns over time. For example, there is increased evidence that people with college degrees are preferring more to move to cities that uh, high amenity cities. So, for example, cities like New York City and San Francisco, uh, there's a sort of educational segregation in the US where people who have high income jobs are moving to places where there are lots of restaurants, there's nice weather, there's bars, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see people who have uh, less than high school, uh, less than college degree, perhaps moving to places where the wages are not quite as high, but the amenities might, and might, the amenities might not also be as high, but the rents and cost of living are cheaper. So what I think is different about developing countries is thinking a little bit about some of the amenities definitely could be some of the story, in which case it might be very much some of the same patterns as what you see, for example, in the US. But one of the potential differences is trying to think a little bit if there's some costs about moving. And so I can be precise about the one study that we did in Indonesia, where what we looked at is we estimated the costs of moving between places in a very non-parametric way. So we didn't make any assumption about what they were, but what we know is we know all of the bilateral moves of people from very small geographical areas. So we know everyone who's moving from one small uh, municipality or sub-region to another region, and then we know everyone who moves back the other direction. So what we can look at is we can use these data flows to back out what the kind of cost must be and we can do the same thing for the US, and then what we can do is correlate these costs that we measure with things like, for example, the distance that people travel. So when we do that, it seems that in both Indonesia, there is a strong relationship with the costs and distance. There is a positive relationship in the US, but the relationship is much weaker. So one story that would be consistent with this is that something like infrastructure quality or how connected places are matters in terms of how easy it is for people to go between places. Somewhere like the US, you have very good highway systems. People also have a little more money. They can fly if they need to. And so labor markets might be more connected. When you think about travel times uh, between, for example, islands in Indonesia where you have to travel by boat, you have to travel on roads that are not very high quality, you could imagine that this is one explanation. So I think, I think in these questions are still open questions in both uh, urban and geography uh, sort of literatures and there hasn't been a lot of focus on thinking exactly about these frameworks that people have been developing to think about what they might mean for developing countries. And I think here the really interesting area to look at is what is the same and what is different and is it something about preferences? Are, are there different, are there similarities? Are there some things that are policies that are more relevant in one angle than another angle? And I think these are very open questions. So. Uh, I don't think it's just a development phenomenon, but I think there might be some really interesting differences that we can study that might help suggest uh, to which ways uh, infrastructure, credit markets, et cetera, et cetera. And then talking about this, two ways that are particularly uh, different that I didn't talk about, but I think you're right, that are both very important, are thinking about property rights and then thinking about information. So with property rights, I think that's clearly a first order, if you were going to estimate one of these models seriously for one of these countries, I think that would be a first order uh, sector that you would want to carefully put into understanding the decision. And the numbers and the data that I put up today were more to set the scene of what we see at the moment, but I haven't looked at all in detail about what happens with land holdings. And I think you would be able to find survey data that would let you look at this and think a little bit carefully about that. So there is a forthcoming or very recent AER paper that looks at this question in Mexico that looks at what happens to migration once people get land rights uh, on their land. What you see there is basically what you would expect, that as people get formal property rights, then they are migrating more. And so you could imagine that parts of the reason that there might be less migration could be because of land tenure issues. Although at the same time, when we do look at the uh, sort of census data, there's surprisingly high levels of migration 
given what we know about land markets not being very active. Then I think the, the next piece of information is uh, a question about information I think is also very important. There I think the best way to do that would be some sort of information experiment. So I know, uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't been something that does that in any African country. I know that one of the treatments that they did in the Bangladesh study was they told people just about the wage differences to see if that made any difference over and above giving people, uh, in this case, small loans. In that case, the information didn't do anything by itself, but the information was quite coarse. So one thing that we've been thinking about with, policy, uh, with projects that we're putting in the field in Indonesia is what we could do a little bit on the information side. And there I think the challenge would be if you could somehow find sort of real time or very high quality information that people are willing to trust in order to make the decisions about moving. So I think this is another really exciting uh, area to explore. We know from many other settings, so for example, work on educational choices, that giving people information does change the decisions they make. So I think it's very likely that if you could find a way to collate high quality information for wages and give that to people, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, it would be a very interesting thing to look at and you could see if that would have an effect in, in itself. So I think these are both really, uh, really exciting possibilities and there's a lot of ways in which you can think about expanding the models and expanding the ideas that people have been studying primarily in non-developing country contexts to incorporating some of these uh, issues that might be more relevant. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just one uh, quick comment on the property rights information in the case of the seasonal migration, I think. Um, uh, Part of what I'm doing, working on seasonal migration in India, is taking for granted what other people have been studying, which is really, you know, the fact that people are very reluctant to leave their village for good or to sell their land, and really, uh, uh, and it's not that easy to sell your land and to get a house somewhere. So in that case, the the low cost uh, option is what I just described, which is to, you know, you keep your land, you keep your village, and you just go go and come back during the same year. Um, and in, in terms of information, I also have this low cost version because I think. I, I do find uh, uh, migrants really reallocating and seem to, to getting the, the, the right amount of information, but they're, they're, they are in, in markets that are relatively simple. So they're, they're like in construction spot market. So they could get, you know, call somebody. And so they, I think as you go up the, the, the level of skills and the, then, then the, you know, it gets much, probably the information friction may be uh, much more, um, you know, much more important. But that's an open question, as the name said. Um, Can I just uh, make one remark on that before I give to brain constipation? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want to point out an analogy that, that uh, with a purpose, that it, it suggests other ways forward in this area. Uh, why don't people move is definitely not a, just a developing country question. Ed Glazer has some work on the US doing a lot of the same things that you were talking about, how much of it is selection, how much of it is credit constraints, et cetera. Um, the, there's a broader question that has been one of the major themes of the best development work in the last few years, and it's why don't people make profitable investments when there's objectively profitable fertilizer to buy, when there's an objectively <coughs> beneficial insurance product offered uh, to you at, a, at a, a reasonable cost, why don't people take it up? Uh, that literature has found uh, fruitful approaches in behavioral economics, looking at other things that we haven't really discussed, salient self-control, many other things. And I think there's a lot of, uh, of uh, unexplored territory in developing countries and developed countries to ask uh, you know, why, why exactly do poor people stay in Appalachia, the United States, when if they, they could be in Miami, they just don't think of themselves as Miamians. Uh, and the, the reasons that they don't do that, even with access to the same capital, same information, et cetera, are, are I think quite parallel to some of the questions that, uh, that uh, some of the top development economists have been asking fruitfully in other areas. Uh, about, uh, let's say, brain waste. Uh, I, although, you know, we don't, we don't know the effect of terminology. The, your, your new terminology could cause a revolution of, uh, of uh, <laughs> scientific inquiry. Uh, so Antonio Spilimbergo, when he wrote his AER paper, is showing that uh, foreign students bring democracy home. Uh, in the working paper version, he compiled a fascinating database that I think he was going to do something else with, with which was, uh, every world leader at the time, he compiled their migration history. Uh, you know, Lee Kuan Yew was uh, outside, uh, 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 outside uh, uh, Singapore for some time. Uh, the, the, 
prison of Kenya at the time had, had studied in the, in the UK. Obvious historical examples, Gandhi spent some time uh, studying law in the, in the UK and uh, speculating about what, what effect that had on their leadership and their effect on institutions back home. Uh, it, it's obviously very hard to get causal identification to tell a quantitative story, and, and that, that particular part of the paper was never uh, developed, but I think that's a very fruitful area, and nobody's ever really worked on that. As, as for scientists, it's just incredibly obvious that that effect is there. Uh, Arthur Lewis exemplifies it, born in St. Lucia, and I, I think it's uh, blindingly obvious that if he had been somehow obliged to stay in St. Lucia by, let's say, a, a, uh, a, an anti-brain drain policy of the uh, 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 United States, he ended up at Princeton after being at uh, LSE in Manchester. Um, he, he never would have been able to do research that made him the, the first uh, African origin Nobel laureate. Um, but again, documenting that quantitatively, knowing what the counterfactual would be if particular skilled migrants had not been able to congregate in the research centers of the world is very difficult. Uh, difficult means interesting. Difficult means major uh, uh, contribution opportunity for young researchers. And, and, uh, the, the, the trouble is that the data sets are not sitting out there for, for you to, to uh, put together a data set uh, uh, connecting migration to scientific contribution or connecting migration to, let's say, governance qual quality, leadership quality. It's something you have to do yourself. But, you know, PhDs are long and uh, <laughs> you have some time to put data together. All right, thank you. Uh, we have so little time left that rather than taking more questions, I think now is a good time to do some thank yous. Um, before I do that, I'm going to point out to you that we do run a journal, and the sort of work that you've been seeing at this conference is exactly the sort of work we want to put into our journal. So if you have a paper and you're not sure where to send it, there's a website, and it's one for you to, to, to definitely consider. Now, in terms of thank yous, uh, first off, we've had a large group of students, more than I can list right now, but people who have been helping you get on the internet, people who have been helping you get to the right room, people who have been helping out with the Vox Pops, basically anybody with a red uh, necklace that if you see them, thank them. You've been, uh, we couldn't have been doing this without you, so thank you. Second, there's a core staff of, of CSA people who you might have seen, you might not have seen, uh, but without them, again, none of this would have happened. Julia, Gail, Richard, Wendy, Suzanne, thank you for all your help leading up to the conference. Thank you to your, for your help during the conference. I have wine for you. Um, <laughs> And lastly, I want to thank Rose Page. Um, every year she does more work for this than I can understand how a single human being could do it. Um, she's the only one who knows how to make any of this happen. Um, and this year has been particularly difficult because we've had a lot of, of, of illness and, and stuff come up at the last minute that had to be dealt with. So even more than most years, thank you to Rose. And because we get asked this every year, we're not feeding you, but there's a lot of good places to eat in this city. We're the red box in the upper right, and there's really two big, um, maybe I put that, no, that's right. Um, and there's two streets that just have tons and tons of restaurants. One of them is George Street, one of them is High Street. They're both 10 minute walks from here. Um, if you want my recommendation, just walk until you see a menu that you like. Um, so thank you, everyone. I hope to see you back next year. Thank you for coming. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you.